For decades, the hallmark of medical treatment for cancer and hematological malignancies has been intravenous cytotoxic chemotherapy. These drugs target rapidly dividing cells, including cancer cells and certain normal tissues. As a result, many patients experience the classic toxicities of alopecia, gastrointestinal symptoms, and myelosuppression. But how we treat these diseases has changed dramatically in the past decades. While traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy remains the treatment of choice, targeted therapies are now a major component in our arsenal in the war on cancer. These novel targeted anti-cancer drug therapies have been designed to block the growth and spread of certain cancers by interfering with specific molecules, called molecular targets, that are involved in the growth, progression, and spread of cancer and hematological malignancies. They have become a component of anti-cancer therapies for many common malignancies, including breast, colorectal, lung, and pancreatic cancers, as well as lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple myeloma. Targeted medicines have changed the course of cancer therapy over the past 20 years. Using genetic markers and diagnostic tests, we've been able to identify the right drug for the right patient. The mechanisms of action and toxicities of targeted therapies, the right drug for the right patient, at the right time, differs from those of traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy. As a result, targeted therapies are generally better tolerated than traditional chemotherapy. Among these targeted drugs are antibody drug conjugates, or ADCs. While today only a small number of antibody drug conjugates have obtained market authorization, a large number of these targeted therapies are in clinical development. Antibody drug conjugates are part of a new wave of targeted antibody-based products at the cutting edge of oncology and hematology. These hybrid molecules consist of a tumor antigen-specific antibody coupled to a chemotherapeutic small molecule. Antibody drug conjugates combine the cell-targeting capability of monoclonal antibodies with the cell-killing ability of highly potent cytotoxic drugs. Through targeted delivery of highly potent cytotoxins, antibody drug conjugates exhibit improved therapeutic index and enhanced efficacy relative to traditional chemotherapies and monoclonal antibody therapies. The manufacturing of these highly potent cytotoxic antibody drug conjugates presents a series of unique challenges requiring specific skills, accuracy, and reliability. During the Essential Protein Engineering Summit, held April 25th through the 29th, 2016, in Boston, Massachusetts, we sat down with Richard Denk, an expert on containment and hygienic design and one of the authors of the Containment Handbook, published by the International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering. Richard Denk is the head of the containment group at SCAN in Switzerland. He has spent nearly 20 years in developing global standards for highly active and highly hazardous substances. Dank addresses the importance of awareness of an acceptable occupational exposure limit, or OEL, when manufacturing antibody drug conjugates. Given the potency of the cytotoxins in antibody drug conjugates, he also discusses the need for specific containment solutions during the manufacturing of these novel anti-cancer agents. ADCs are a new generation of extremely potent or, let's say, hazardous substances on the market. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, we spoke about exposure limit, I mean, OEL, occupation exposure limit, for the operator working in a facility in the microgram level. This is what allowed per meter cubic. Uh, but with that type of uh, ADCs, we talk about very low nanogram levels. This is really a challenge how to deal with them as I think the most important part is to get an awareness 
into the industry that they know how potent this product is. I brought here some kind of an, an example. So this is a vial, a vial where in the end normally those products are liable said and then uh, get to the market. So this is only one gram inside, it's not much. And this one gram is something where often the people think, yeah, we deal here in the early stage only with, with one or a few grams of this product. But the OEL is around a few nanograms, what is allowed for the operator to expose. And when I say, what is one gram to a nanogram? So maybe easy to explain, it's one gram is 1,000 milligrams, is one million micrograms, is one billion nanograms. And to deal with that kind of substances in the manufacturing, we need very specific containment solutions. And containment solutions, I mean very specific ones, there is not many on the market who can reach such a low OEL level. In general, are those uh, technical solutions like isolators, isolators where we put around the process to protect the operators to get not exposed to the product during operations. But even when we speak about is isolators, there is various different types of isolators on the market. And you need for such a low lef OEL level kind of isolators where we have a double protection. That means when we transfer the material in and out of this isolator, then we have to various barrier systems to get the material in, to weigh it and dispense it, maybe to a formulation tank. For example, is this that we have such a transfer system to an airlock, could be like such an RTP, rapid transfer port, from there we get the material into an airlock, then prepare it, and from the airlock we get it into the main chamber for open in the back, weighing the material and get it then to the next process step. And the same procedures we have to do to get the material out of the isolator. Some of the challenges with such a double protection isolators are also, for instance, the, the filter technology. So when we have in a, such an isolator, we have a certain amount of air changes, we have powder which goes in, powder exposed to the air, and we have to filter those uh, powder before it goes out of the isolator. This is a an, an big challenge because we speak about small quantities and we have to have their very specific filter technology that we avoid that product gets out to the atmosphere. And on the other hand, we have also to make sure when they change product, that through to the isolator technology, no back contamination in the product area is possible. And this makes also the difference on a high-end isolator to other isolators on the market. Because there you need specific filter technology which is also designed like an isolator. And this filter technology is attached to the isolator and can be then opened towards the isolator where the dust goes in. And after the product is then finished, you close the filter from outside, you can wash everything and then remove the filter and the material inside the filter is protected and then it can go to incineration. So in chemical production, when we have uh, weighed the material then in the isolator, then we speak mostly about small quantities. Small quantities, as I have mentioned before, a few grams. And they are normally recommend not to do any additional transfer with the, with the powder anymore. Better is that the companies yeah, dilute the powder in, in liquid in the isolator and then pump it with a peristatic pump into the conjugation vessel or whatever the next process step is to avoid a loss of product and to avoid additional risk of exposure during transferring product in other areas. I think this is quite important, not only that you protect the operator for additional transfer steps, this is also as we speak about small quantities, we want not to lose material uh, during this transfer. And so when we get this in a, in a liquid base and we pump it from there into the vessel, then we avoid that we have losses and we avoid that additional exposure for the operators. So after conjugation, you have your sterile filtration with the product and then it goes to the fill finish area. 
feel finished means it's coming back to that what I have explained before with the powder. You have some kind of vials where you feel then uh, the liquid in it. This goes then uh, after filling into live realization and freeze dryers. And after the freeze drying process, it gets then in a washer where, where the outer part is then washed and decontaminated before it leaves that area. A challenge on those uh, area is that the septic processing was not that exposed with so low OEL levels as they are required for ADCs. So and, uh, and, and the differences to that isolators, what I have mentioned before in chemical production is that in aseptic processing, the isolators have to run in overpressure. The overpressure is needed to avoid that from outside gets any contamination inside the isolator. There is GMP very important. So we have to avoid any risk from outside that we get the bacteria or whatever inside to contaminate the product. So we have inside the isolator and aseptic processing also specific clean room quality like ISO 5, where we have to reduce the particles inside the isolator and we have to monitor this. So there we are have an additional uh, critical area. So we have an isolator which have a lot of air change inside and we run this in overpressure. So we have to avoid that we get any contamination to this overpressure outside of the isolator. Some companies thinking uh, we fill those liquids into vials and then it's not critical. I have seen their installations where they have done this in an open wrap system or an open uh, grade A or ISO 5 environment. And, uh, and then they think, okay, as long as it's liquid, as long as in the vial, nothing is critical. But this is not true. The substance itself is the same toxic as the powder what we have discussed before. So when a vial break or when there is some spillage and normally the liquid in a such uh, clean room conditions dry out very fast within a couple of minutes and then we have the pure substance there as powder form and this powder can then be also distributed to all over the place all over the area in an isolator and this gets then to an, a critical effect that this leads to a cross contamination to other areas or to contaminate also the, the vials inside of the isolator. And to solve this problem, there we work also with a company called Bausch & Ströbel. They are very specialized in liquid filling and in this combination with our isolators where we have a special airflow in it, where we have very special designed filters where we filter the material before it leaves the isolator. So that the material, when it gets exposed, goes directly into the filters, is filtered and that there is no risk that the particles can spread out in other areas. So we spoke a lot about operator protection. But besides the operator protection, uh, the product protection is the same important or a partly even more important as this product is a given to many patients. So what I face is that there is in the companies always two departments. There is one department which is focused on quality assurance, GMP, how to protect the product from any cross-contamination. And there is another department where they are focused on the operator protection. They say, we put something around to protect the operators. So often the people, as in many other companies, they do not really talk to each other. They have the different risk assessments. And there I think they have to get much closer together. They have to sit together and then when the person will say, I'm installing something for the operator protection, to consider what impact does this have to my product? Does it have an additional impact on cross-contamination? Is it cleanable? And this is an other topic, cleanability of the equipment what we use. You know, we speak about an OEL of, an, of less than a few nanograms per meter cubic. But where does this OEL coming from? This comes from requirements of acceptable daily exposures, ADEs. And those acceptable daily exposures give, you, give us the requirements of 
of the cleanability of the substance. So we have to avoid any cross contamination or we have to lower the cross contamination to that value what, is, what was calculated based on these ADEs. So, and on those cleaning values, what we have there, we have to think about how we can clean it and how we can avoid any cross contamination. And when we think about maybe a, an, an OEL of five nanograms, this is maybe only one particle of 0 0.5 micrometer, which is already too much as allowance from the previous to the next product. So on the, the cleanability of the substance, we have uh, spoken before about multi-time numbers of the one gram to a few nanograms. And this is also something what we have to calculate based on acceptable daily exposures called. So from the acceptable daily exposures, those OEL levels are calculated. But those acceptable daily exposures are the limits where you calculate also the cleaning. And cleaning is in that way necessary to avoid any cross-contamination from the previous produced product to the next product. So in general, when we have maybe a requirement of those few nanogram exposure limit, then we have also a requirement which is 10 times a little bit higher than the OEL is the acceptable daily exposure. And we speak about, as said, these multiple numbers in the, this far end then we only speak about a few nanograms on exposure limit between uh, different products. So the, the risk of cross-contamination is extremely high with such low OEL products what we have discussed before. So when the vial is washed, then uh, the most of the process engineers who design a facility to manufacture ADCs are thinking my work is done. So I have the vial, the product protected in a vial, and then uh, it goes somewhere. But this is not true. So in the end, we have those hazardous substances in small quantities in those kinds of small vials. And the next step is that this vial has to be inspected and later on also packed. So and only because it's closed and sealed, to say there is no risk is not true, because the risk, I carry this vial in my hand. What is the risk? The risk is that I carry it, but it could fall down. And when a such a vial breaks, it's an immediately hazard. So a hazard is, as the vial breaks, the powder gets out and can be distributed all over the place. And this is often not considered that they say, this vial is closed but something could happen. So there is also containment needed during the inspection of the vials, and even more in the area where you pack those vials. Because for packaging, the vials have to be separated, have to be turned, and then they're pushed in the carton, and then they were closed. But all on those steps, there can be some breakage on the vials, and this is the critical area when such a vial breaks during packaging, then uh, this contaminates the other vials in the row, and this contaminates also the outer part of the packaging. And when, when those packaging goes then into the hospitals and the nurse open it, then she's immediately in contact with the substance outside of this vial. And there is it also important to have containment on packaging machines, and there we work very closely together with Ullmann packaging system and we're developed on technology how we can isolate those vials and safely pack it in vials that there is not a risk of contamination to the, for the nurses in the hospital when they open them this. Important for the future are technical solutions to provide a safe manufacturing of ADCs. On one side to protect the operator and the other side to avoid any cross-contamination between different products manufactured in that same equipment. Next, in Changing Strategies in the War on Cancer, Part 3, Improving Outcomes in the Treatment of Breast Cancer.